between a global pandemic, a crazy election, and everything else that's happened in 2020, honestly, most of us are just ready for this year to be over and let's move on with the next one. But thankfully, the good news is no matter what's going on in the world right now, no matter what you're facing personally, you still can find true joy and peace in the midst of any circumstances you're facing. Today on the Equipping Godly Women podcast, we are speaking with Shanti Feldhahn, author of the brand new devotional, Find Joy, a devotional journey to unshakable wonder in an uncertain world. In today's interview, Shanti is sharing the difference between happiness and joy, something that we're doing that unfortunately self-sabotages us from experiencing this joy, as well as some super practical ways that we can experience more joy in our lives no matter what we're going through today. So whether you are facing an impossible situation or you're just annoyed with 2020 and ready for it to be over, I really hope you'll stay tuned. Well, thank you, Shanti, so much for being on the Equipping Godly Women podcast today. Will you start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, And thanks for having me on, by the way. Really appreciate that. Yeah, my, I have a very interesting um, sort of different background. I um, am primarily a social researcher, and my background is not... um, what normally you would think of for people like that, I actually started out on Wall Street and I have a really analytical background. And a number of years ago, God did this real right hand turn in my life to sort of use that background and that skill set, that experience, in order to help people thrive in their lives and relationships. And, um, and I've written a bunch of nonfiction um, books to help people in their relationships, like to help women understand men, which is always a fun topic. Um, but really, over the last few years, I've really felt this leading um, from the Lord to really try to pull together what are the things, especially for women, that we're all longing for and how do we get there. Um, it's a it's very, very personal project for me. It just happens to be using that analytical background in a very unusual way. Well, I love that. And your latest book, Find Joy, could not come at a better time than this year with everything that we are dealing with in 2020 with COVID and all of the things. So I wanted to ask you, of course, all about the book and the topic of finding joy. But I wanted to start first with why do you think it is that so many of us this year, but also in general, really struggle to find joy in our lives? You know, I think, and this is really where it comes down for, I think, not just me, but in general, most of us, is it is so easy for us to conflate happiness and joy and for us to essentially look at all of the stuff that's going on this year. And I mean, I don't know about you, I have to laugh or I would cry. I mean, it's just everything has been insane. Like all of our speaking engagements were canceled when everything shut down in March. And it's just gotten more interesting from there, right? Um, and, and yet, it is absolutely profound for us as believers to be willing to take a step back and say, why am I being thrown by 2020? Like, why is it that it's hit me so hard? Because it shouldn't. And that's really one of the big things that I've really been wrestling with is, you know what, our joy our true, eternal, godly joy should not be shaken depending on our circumstances. And that's really, I think, what we have to wrestle with. We're used to the idea of happiness, like something goes right, and so you're happy because something makes you happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what we're sort of the highest calling that we're called to as believers, which is we're supposed to be living in a joy that is not dependent on our circumstances. So you make a good point that there is a difference between happiness and joy. I know that people have talked about this some in the past, but how would you define the difference between happiness and joy? What does that look like um, to balance between those two? Well, I mean, truly, it's what I started to say right there, which is that 
happiness is to some degree kind of tied to what's going on in our lives. I mean, and again, it's not like that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, today I am happy because I am finally past two weeks in bed with COVID. <laughs> I was telling you earlier, Brittany, this is my first interview that I've done in two weeks. Am I happy about that? Yes, because <laughs> I can actually breathe and, um, and I'm not in bed and I'm actually not all that happy about catching up on two weeks of emails, but that's a whole other topic. But the circumstances today are good. I'm grateful for that. Nothing wrong with that. However, it's not the same thing as this deep, unshakable, eternal joy that God wants me to have, whether I am lying in bed, hacking and coughing with COVID, or whether or not things happen to be going well that day. It, the, the best analogy that I can, that I can give, that I felt like God kind of downloaded this idea to me when I first started this project, um, was, you know, the, um, you know, that feeling that you get at Christmas where for, I mean, I know that for some people, Christmas is a really hard season of year, but in general, most of us have this feeling like real life is kind of holding its breath for a couple of weeks. You know, where you just feel like the molecules of the air are filled with some wonder, something heavenly, something different. And that's what the angels said, right? I've come to get, bring you good news of great joy. It's like joy is in the air. And I realized somewhere along the way, that feeling that you're living in, in those couple of weeks in December, that joy, that's what God wants us to live in all year long. That sounds wonderful. I know in your book, you talk about eight elements of finding joy. Can you share some of those with us? It's just a really practical, okay, maybe circumstances around us aren't perfect. Maybe we're not happy about different circumstantial things that are going on, but what are some of these eight ways that we can find true joy no matter what's going on in our lives right now? Well, the, it, it really is a matter of practicing some of these. We And I should explain, by the way, it was so fascinating when I dug into what is it that it looks like to really find joy, like that true joy, how do you do that? What does that look like? And so I dug not only into what does scripture say, but what does science say? Because, you know, I'm a social researcher, I'm a social scientist. And the thing that's really cool, by the way, is that what neuroscience says, neurobiology, et cetera, backs up what scripture has said all along, which I just love that. Um, and there's basically eight themes that run through both science and scripture. And one of them is the absolute need to practice gratitude. It's interesting. We all know that having an attitude of gratitude is crucial. I mean, we tell our kids that, right? Have an attitude of gratitude. And yet for us as grownups, sometimes it's a little hard to go, what does that look like? Like, how do you do that? And, um, and I'll give you an example of something that is so profound that we see in both the neuroscience and you see also in the Bible um, is in terms of how you do that. One of the things I think probably, Brittany, if you're, if you're like me, if you're listeners or anything like me, you know, for, for me as a woman, one of the things that will steal my joy quicker than almost anything else is if I'm at odds with somebody who is close to me like my husband or a close friend, for example. Like for us as women, it's like if something is going on in those relationships, nothing is right with the world until that's resolved, right? And, and it's interesting, there's a, a passage in scripture that tackles a situation exactly like that and gives gratitude and a sort of a prescription for how you get there as the solution. If you look at Philippians 4, for example, you see that it starts with Paul talking about these two women who are having this significant personality conflict. And I don't know if you've ever been at odds with a good friend. I know I have. It's not good. It's not fun. And Paul, basically, in Philippians 4, he pleads with these women to get along and figure out how to be friends again. And when, you, and when you look at what he says for how to do that, he says the first thing is rejoice. He says, I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Like, this is a big deal. 
And you kind of go, okay, well, first of all, what does it have to do with anything? <laughs> what does rejoice have to do with fixing a friendship to begin with? But then secondly, how do you rejoice when you're in a difficult situation? Like Paul is in prison, he's chained to a wall. You know, these women are part of a persecuted church where they could be killed at any moment. Like, how do you rejoice in a prison or a difficult marriage or a difficult friendship? And he says, here's the prescription. He tells you just a few verses later, if you look at Philippians 4, 8, he says, here's how you do that. You think on those things that are excellent. You think on those things that are lovely. You think about those things that are worthy of praise rather than the things that are worthy of driving you crazy. <laughs> and that is the prescription for practicing gratitude, whether it's in need of fixing a relationship or anything that's going on in a difficult season in your life, is to truly think about, focus on, attune yourself to, and thank God for those things that are good right now. And I think you're right how you mentioned earlier, we help our kids do this. I know I talk to my kids all the time about gratitude. If they start complaining, I'm like, okay, how can we put this in a nicer way? How can we find something nice? Like yesterday, I was literally feeding my kids homemade raspberry cheesecake. And I'm like, here you go. Here is this cheesecake we made together. I mean, it's cheesecake. Who's going to complain? It has an Oreo crumb cake or... Oh my yes. gosh, Brittany. <laughs> it was so good. Like we took the time, got together with the kids, made this cheesecake. It's amazing. And all three of my kids sat at the counter and they're like, well, I don't really like cream cheese. It's not really that good. And I'm like, really, we just made a cheesecake. And this is what you're going to tell me is, well, I don't really like cream cheese. How about... Thanks, mom, for making a dessert with us. How about, thanks, mom, this Oreo crust is really yeah. good. And we'd have these conversations with our kids where we're like, okay, you could complain about one negative thing or like, let's start thinking of something positive. I tell my kids this all of the time. Um, but then as adults, we don't always do this. We get stuck as, oh, this one negative thing that, okay, that's going to take up our entire brain space. That's all we're thinking about is this one thing. And maybe it is really bad, I'm sure. I'm sure people who are listening to this right now are dealing with things much worse than a cheesecake that they didn't like. But there's still, no matter what's going on, there's always going to be something positive, a yeah. different way you can reframe it. I was having a conversation um, with a friend quite a while, a few weeks ago, I don't remember when, um, but they were saying, okay, what was something positive that came out of 2020? And I really had to think, and I was like, you know what? My faith is stronger than it's ever been. My marriage is better yeah. than it's ever been. My parenting, I've spent so much more time with the kids than I ever have. I ran a ton of miles. I got a ton of work done. Yes, there were a lot of bad things that happened this year, but there were a lot of good things that happened this year as well. So just taking the time to intentionally look for what are those good things? Well, and it's the thing that is very easy. It is very easy for us to flip back into whatever our habits and our neural pathways are for whether we're used to looking at those things and practicing gratitude or not. And, and I, I have to tell you what a group of um, scientists found about this because this, it, first of all, it cracked me up. I actually had to put one of the devotional days on this exact story because it just made me laugh um, because we don't recognize how easy it is for us to fall into patterns. And it's either going to be sort of the good and healthy patterns, or it's going to be something that causes issues. And we just don't necessarily even realize it. There was a group of um, plastic surgeons, of all people, in I think London, in the UK, somewhere, um, a number of years ago, these plastic surgeons noticed that their Botox patients, you know, you inject Botox to get rid of lines and wrinkles, and they had noticed that these patients were having such a better, like, positive outlook. Um, they, they actually submitted Botox to their equivalent of the FDA as potentially having an off-label use as an antidepressant because they thought that there maybe is like some sort of chemical in Botox that might serve as an antidepressant because all of their patients just felt more positive. And so they, they looked at this and then they realized 
it actually had nothing to do with there being some sort of chemical antidepressant in Botox. It turns out that Botox paralyzes the frown muscles. These people couldn't frown. And when they couldn't make a frowny face, when they couldn't make that frowny face, they felt less frowny. <laughs> and so they literally couldn't make the negative expression that maybe habitually some of us kind of fall into. And so they felt less negative and more positive. And it's like, oh my gosh, we can skip the shot of Botox to the forehead and just do Philippians 4.8. Like literally just forcing ourselves into a different aspect, into looking at what is it that I can smile about today? What is it that's going on? Like you mentioned the list with, you know, your husband and your kids and there's all of us have that kind of stuff. Every single one of us has both the negative and the positive. And the key is that we are commanded. We are commanded to think about, to think on those things that are really excellent and lovely. They're always there. So how do you recommend that women do this, super practically speaking? If they're stuck in a pattern where they're used to being negative all the time, what practical like action steps do they do to be more positive and grateful? Well, the easiest thing, if you, and to me, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that we do it, and it's why actually we created Find Joy as a daily devotional instead of, it would have, you know, it would have been easy to write a big nonfiction book on you know what we found in the research about how important all these different patterns were but the key is to practice a little bit at a time every day rather than trying to overwhelm yourself by doing it all at once and so if you look at just philippians 4 8 as just one example then the key is every single time that you find yourself getting frustrated by whatever it is to actually stop and to go, okay, I'm thinking on whatever is not worthy of praise right now. <laughs> what can I think about that's worthy of praise? And I guarantee you will find it. Like it could be something really simple. It could be something really big. I was getting really worried and I'll give you an example. I, I was getting really worried um, a couple weeks ago before I came down with COVID. Um, all, you know, all of our speaking engagements have been badly disrupted. Our income this year has been badly disrupted by the the shutdowns and everything else that's been going on and i was really worried one evening about how am i going to pay my staff am i going to have to lay people off how are we going to pay the mortgage you know those kinds of questions those are real questions right and that evening it those thoughts came up in my head while i was sitting around a fire pit with some friends of mine who live across the street and we were roasting s'mores and kind of sharing life and fellowshipping and talking on a Saturday night, sitting around a fire pit. And I start having these thoughts in my head about how am I gonna pay my staff? And I had to force myself to go, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> like what an incredible blessing. Yeah, it's been hard to not be out on the road speaking, but you know what? If I was out on the road speaking and earning that income, pay the staff salaries, I wouldn't be normally have this huge blessing of sitting around a fire pit with friends. I never get to do that during the normal seasons when I'm on the road speaking at women's events. And here I am absolutely loving catching up with friends in a way that I haven't been able to do in years. And it's a matter of in the moment when you find yourself nervous, worried, frustrated, go, Lord, I'm going to give that over to you. And thank you for this other thing over here that is an incredible blessing, even though this other thing over here might be a challenge. You, you, it is literally just a matter of changing your perspective. Okay, so let me ask you this follow-up question then. Yeah. I understand that that would be really great for finding joy and feeling more peaceful. However, 
I would imagine we don't want to go so far where we're like, oh, we have these huge financial problems and we've been laid off and we are going to get evicted, but let's just think about happy things. So how do you balance the difference between, okay, we want to be grateful for where we're at and all the good things, but there may be some significant issues that we really do need to address and not just think happy thoughts. Well, there's nothing that says finding joy and taking action are mutually exclusive, right? I mean, that's one of the things that we, our whole uh, ministry, we are trying very hard to honor God in our thought processes, in finding gratitude and practicing that, doing everything I just said, and at the same time, pivoting and going, okay, and this is what, <laughs> this is what we had to do. If you're watching us on video right now, you'll see I'm in a, a video studio. Well, that's because when everything shut down, we're kind of like, huh, in-person events are probably not going to be a thing for a while. We need to build a video studio in our basement <laughs> so that we can do video events. And so it's not mutually exclusive. Just because you're trying to honor God in your thought life doesn't mean you also don't take actions that he leads you to do. And that can be a way of honoring God as well, because you're stewarding Absolutely. what he has given you and using the brain he has given you to make positive choices to take good care of your family. And you can be grateful at the same time that you're also reaching for more and stability and all of those things as well. Yeah, exactly. The, the key is, and here's the hard, I mean, this is just the reality, right? It is a matter truly of deciding in the middle of everything, it doesn't matter what is actually going on around me, I am going to choose to honor God with my thought life. I am going to choose to find joy in that way that he has commanded us to. I mean, Jesus came, the angel said, not just the news of Jesus's birth would cause great joy, but Jesus came to bring us good, good news of great joy. I've brought you good news of great joy, the angel said. If Jesus came in part so that we could have this abundant life and have this sense of joy regardless of what's going on, it's kind of arrogant for us to not do that. It's kind of arrogant to say, well, sorry, God, you don't really know my troubles. <laughs> And instead, God's like, yeah, I do. And I want you to live in that sense of heavenly wonder, no matter what. It's all part of trusting me. Yeah, I love that you say that. And it also says something about God, too, when you inadvertently, because I'm sure people don't do this on purpose, but when you inadvertently say, oh, my problems are so big, God can't handle them. Or my problems are so big that God doesn't care. He can't come through. He can't. Well, God's got, and he's got it figured out and he's got a plan and he knows what he's doing. And just because you don't know everything doesn't mean God doesn't know everything. And I have this conversation with my kids all the time too. And they're worried, freaking out of, oh, what are we going to do? What about this? And I'm just like, you don't need to know. You're a kid. Just be oh, I like that. a parent. I will take care of everything. It will be fine. And then like, if I do things that don't make sense to them, my oldest especially is like really smart. So he's like, oh, well, we need to do it this way. I'm like, no, like there's a reason. And then later, eventually when he learns the reason, he's like, oh, oh. does that make sense? I'm like, I knew the reason all along. You just need to trust me because I'm your parent and I know what we're doing and we're going to be fine. Like you don't have to question. And yeah, we do the same thing to God all the time. Like, God, are you sure you can take care of this? Is going to be okay? Is it going to be fine? It's fine. It's going to be fine. It, it, is, it is such a good analogy, Brittany. I'm serious. And one of the things, one of the other elements that we found that was, it's so easy to not do that we have to also force ourselves to do is to remember those things in the past that God did do to take care of us or whatever the issue was and go, oh yeah, huh, he did that before. He's, he's probably got this one too. I mean, I love, I don't know about you, I love the story in the Old Testament of after the Israelites have been wandering in the desert for all those years and God finally says, okay, it's time for you to go, go into the promised land. Like you've been waiting for all these years. It's time. And, you know, if you think about it, that was a very strange command because there's now probably two or three million Israelites, you know, all of the men, women, kids, carts, oxen, like, I don't know. There was just a lot of household goods 
that had probably been built up over 40 years of wandering in the desert. And God says, hey, go cross the Jordan and, and you know, take the promised land. And it's like the Jordan's in flood stage and there's no bridge. Like, how <laughs> is this supposed to happen? And, you know, God does this incredibly miraculous thing where as soon as the priests step into the, the Jordan, the water backs up again and they walk over into the promised land. And I love that God says to take some big stones from the middle of the river where they walked over on dry land and pile them up as like a cairn, as a rock pile, so that when you're in the land and you're having to, again, fight the giants or walk around Jericho and have the walls fall, like whatever it is that you're having to do that's so challenging, that you can look at that rock pile and go, oh, right, right, yes, God backed up the Jordan <laughs> so that we could go across and take the promised land. He's got this one too. And we need to do that same thing. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that this year as well. Just remembering, okay, God did this in my past. God promised me this in the past. The Bible says this. So like, I can cling to those things because God didn't change just because America changed this year. Like he's still just as much in charge as he's been for thousands, you know, however long, eternal, um, forever. So he's still in charge. He still knows what he's doing. It's okay if I don't know. He's got it under control. So yeah. That's a great way of putting it, Brittany. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you another thing. You said in your book that there's something that we do that sabotages our joy. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about what that is? Yes, you're not going to like it. <laughs> and I think a lot of us do this and don't realize it. The, the one thing that you can see the most in science and scripture that sabotages our joy is expressing discontent, whether it is in person because I don't know about you, but I know there's a lot of us as women that, I don't know, something that your husband is doing is driving you crazy. You go to a girlfriend and roll your eyes and you're like, Ugh, can't believe you did that thing again. Okay. That's an example of expressing discontent, exasperation, whatever that is, or you're on social media and you're really worried about politics or you're really worried about what your kids are doing or whatever it is. And you throw out something that's you're frustrated by that's expressing discontent text messages whatever it is whenever we do that we do not realize that we are undermining that sense of joy that god wants us to live in i have had to unfollow so many people this year and my friends list is yep. very small anyways but just because i'm like i don't want to log into facebook every day and see the bickering like we should do better <laughs> than this and i don't need that in my life like it's not going to change my mind either way that people are sharing all of this fake news and just hating on each other i'm like i don't care i don't yep. see it right now well it's it's more important than that, I'm glad that you gave that example because it's actively damaging. Um, it's interesting. We have believed a really a, an urban legend, a, a myth um, for many years about the fact that venting is actually healthy. You know, this whole concept of you venting is even even the word is that you're venting some steam out of the kettle so it doesn't explode, right? Like that's the concept. It's interesting, I was doing a, um, an event, a virtual event, of course, for a large public university where um, this was, I don't know, maybe a month ago, and they were doing something on mental health because that's something that's a big deal for university students. So they'd asked me to come in and speak on improving our mental health. And, um, and I asked this group of college students and I, I gave them an example of something that was a really frustrating situation where they were being treated unfairly. It was act, you know, actively frustrating. And I asked these students, what's the healthiest response to this? And 88% of the students said the healthiest response is to vent a little frustration out so you don't explode later. And it turns out neuroscientists have found that that is actually inaccurate neurologically and that the concept of venting the steam out isn't isn't accurate it turns out a better analogy when you express your frustration that way is that you're actually activating an interconnected anger system in your brain it's more like you're turning up the heat under the pot 
that's the better analogy. And that as you do that, your the heat goes higher and higher and higher and the steam gets more and more and more. And that instead, if you will refuse to do that, it's like you've taken the pot off the burner and the steam just kind of goes away. Like you just don't get as frustrated. It's just that we have to get over this idea that it's healthy to vent a little. So what would you recommend that somebody does? Say that there is a wife who is so frustrated with her husband or she's so frustrated with her children. Does that mean she shouldn't go to her friends and talk about it at all? And when her friends are like, how is everything? And she's like, everything's amazing. And I'm just going to think grateful all thoughts and that's it. Like, is there a time and place or a way where she can be real and say what's going on? Or is it just, nope, we don't talk about that. Yeah, because the worst thing that you want, you don't want the happy, happy white picket fence. Everything is fine if it's not. And I'll give you the, the sort of the rule. And this is actually what neuroscientists have found that makes a difference. And it looks to me to be what the Bible talks about. Because the Bible talks a lot about not grumbling and complaining, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot in there about that. And what's the difference if you are having, let's just say you're having a difficult time with your husband or a difficult time with your kids, whatever the example is. You have to be honest. I have to be honest with myself and recognize that sometimes when I go to a girlfriend and I am sharing something, I am sharing something for the pleasure of saying, you would not believe what happened in my household yesterday. And that is the unhealthy thing, as opposed to going to a close friend and saying, look, I don't want to get into a ton of details, but I need some advice. And being very calm and asking sort of for mutual support and asking for prayer. And there is a real need for us to be very honest with ourselves about what's the motivation behind why I'm sharing what I'm sharing. Is it so that I can, you and I can bond over the, oh my gosh, what a crazy thing. Or is it so that I truly can get some support and some counsel. And maybe that even comes with, no, I'm not going to share all the details that would, I would love to tell you what's actually going on, but maybe I'm not supposed to. And actually experimenting with that and seeing if God changes your ability to find joy in the midst of it. Yeah. Cause I would hate to cut out, all of those conversations all together. I know that I have had conversations with my girlfriends where it is very helpful and not in a kind of complaining, nagging sort of way, but just to be able to say, hey, here's what my, like, especially when I was like an early newlywed, like, here's what my life and my marriage looks like. Like, is, does yours look the same? Like, is this normal? Is this okay? And to yeah. have another girlfriend who's, who can be like, yes, my husband is the exact same way. And like, this is normal. Like, here's how we get through it. And so a little bit of, just kind of feeling out like, how do I feel about this? Sometimes I have to talk about it, but not in the sense of, well, let me come trash talk my husband. Um, and I think that there, that would be a big difference. Huge difference. And it's a great example, Brittany, truly. I mean, that, that is one of the examples that I think every woman knows the difference, if we're honest with ourselves, is and we all know what it feels like to be in a group of women where suddenly you're realizing, wait, how in the, are we in the middle of a gripe fest about what's going on with husbands or our kids or whatever? And recognizing that kind of sense of the Holy Spirit going, this isn't healthy. We all know what that feels like. The key is that some, I hate to say it, some of us have grown to find joy in that. And it is absolutely unhealthy and it's counterfeit and it's damaging and it'll kill us as opposed to what God says for us, which is to set aside all grumbling and complaining, shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation. Look for the things, if, if it's a true gripe fest, look for the ways to turn that. Look for the ways to bring up something positive. But if you need support, absolutely, of course, that's all part of why God says we're not meant to do life alone. We're supposed to have fellowship so that we can support one another. 
Well, Shanti, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Will you just give us quick information about your book, what is in it, who was it for, and where we can find it? Sure. The, the devotional is called Find Joy. And, um, and I, the, the subtitle that they chose, I just love it. It's Find Joy, a devotional journey to unshakable wonder in an uncertain world. And that's really the, the point behind it, is every day for us to take a little step in that direction and practice how does this apply to me, this learning, this scripture, this story, and that's it for that day. And then the next day, there's a different element that we work on. And when you do that little by little, it's a 60-day devotional, and the whole point is to take us on a journey so that you end up in a completely different place of really, truly living in that real joy that isn't dependent on our circumstances. And I love how you said that it makes so much sense for this book to be a devotional. So you can get in every morning, every afternoon, whenever it is, but every day, and you can get in and have that reminder and work on it over time rather than just how I like to read books is just sit for two hours straight and like skim through the whole thing. And I'm like, yes, gonna have more joy. And a week later, I'm like, yeah, I don't even remember what I read. So I love this idea of a devotional. It sounds perfect. Um, thank you, Shanti, so much for coming on the podcast today. I love talking with you. Thanks, Brittany. All right, that just about does it for today's interview. If you would love to hear more from Shanti, I would highly encourage you to check out her brand new devotional, Find Joy, a devotional journey to unshakable wonder in an uncertain world. With 60 daily devotionals, this book will absolutely help you get on track to experiencing more gratitude as we close out 2020 and get ready to start 2021 strong. Speaking of starting 2021 strong, if you have not heard yet, my brand new book, Fall in Love with God's Word, Practical Strategies for Busy Women is now available for pre-order. You can learn more about this book and get the first chapter for free by going to fallinlovewithgodsword.com and you'll find all of the details there. And then last but not least, as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? We come back here all the time to bring you great interviews with inspiring Christian women who can help you be the amazing Christian woman, wife, and mother that God created you to be. So go ahead, check out both of those books, subscribe to the podcast, and we'll see you back here again real soon. All right, bye!